Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back to Third Eye Salon. I am Kat Udero with the lovely goddess, Linda Coulter. Linda Coulter Burge. Hello, everyone. Today, we are going to talk about triggers and echo chambers. And you might think, well, why would this is about psychic exploration and otherworldly inter interdimensional, et cetera, et cetera. Why are triggers and echo chambers important? And I think I'll, I'll speak for myself and then get Linda's feedback on this as well, her input. Um, to me, this is, this is important because it's a, just something that our American culture at least is so thick with reactions and taking sides and pointing fingers and being right and being superior and it's very very divisive and there are going to be things that we speak on and speak about and explore in the show which may trigger you and we would love for you and anyone who's viewing to be able to understand that that trigger point is actually a place to do some work it might be a place to do some house cleaning. It may be a place to get grounded. Any number of things, depending on your situation. But if you are going to get triggered and then stop the conversation and cut out, then you're really denying your own growth and you're denying your own expansion your, and your own evolution. And Linda and I are all about community, conversation, mutual respect, and learning how to do that better and better ourselves, eating our humble pie when we mess up and don't do that very well. So that sort of inclusive arm linking, let's grow together is part and parcel of what we're here to do and co-create. Absolutely, Kat. And as you were saying that, I think about all of the wonderful times when you've held up a mirror, I call it the dragonfly magic that you have mm -hmm. of saying how amazing it is that that's pointed out to you and we'll go into detail but it's it's i fully hope and expect from our audience to have dialogue and call me out if i show up and i'm triggered because guess what? It's going to happen. <laughs> I'm human. And those are some of my best aha moments. And always just for each other, remember it's done in love. And not in an effort to be right. To do it in a mode of question. Mm -hmm. So always being in the question. And always being in the celebration of exploration. And to be supportive, to piggyback Absolutely. on that, as opposed to, well, you seem pretty triggered right now. Like coming in and um, putting my finger on a wound and saying, do you see that wound you have? Do you see that you're wounded right there? Which isn't supportive versus, wow, I it seems like this really upsets you. Is there, can we talk about this? Because I'd really like you to I encourage you to take ownership. And if this is a part of you that feels victimized somewhere, I would, I would love for you to be able to work through that and overcome it and make it an, uh, an asset to you versus a trigger that you aren't able to control. There's a yes. different dynamic of support versus I'm going to fix you, but I'm, you know, not looking at my stuff, but I can certainly see your stuff and, and help you. Right. And, and there's a huge thing about I'm because of what I do for a living. My natural tendency is I want to be a fixer. That's been my, that I have fixed problems since I was a kid. I'm a fixer. And so there are times when I have you to come back and say, this is great, but I need to just be heard right now. I love that you have all these ideas, but I just need to be heard right now. And sometimes that's all we need is that sounding board. Um, and I appreciate those times when people are willing to do that with me and remind me. 
um, because I know I'm triggering someone because I'm not listening. Mm. Because my actions, even though it's, it's still, I can do something on my part to be more present. And that's my role in it. Um, and to walk my talk. And so that's a lot of what we're talking about here is walking our talk and backing our smack. And um, when we're talking about triggers and we're talking about echo chambers today, a lot of it is about exploring, owning our own stuff, our own feelings, our own reactions. And so that's what we're going to talk about because we are going to, we're going to say things that trigger people. We're going to trigger each other for goodness sakes. We do all the time. <laughs> and now it's this, Oh, how wonderful we get to explore that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because we do it in a way that it's, it's coming from love because we're rooting so hard for the other person. It's, we know that when we do that, it is not meant to judge the other person, but more of like, is that really working for you? Is that what you want? Is, and sometimes it's like, yeah, that is what I want. It's like, okay, I need to respect your choices and not, you know, try to finesse your details. They're not my details to finesse, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're, we're on this journey to explore and experience and if we were all experiencing the same thing, it would be pretty boring. If we were all reacting the same way, it'd be pretty boring. Well, I think that's the whole point of being on this planet in these physical bodies where we get to have the illusion of separation. When we are on the other side, in, you know, in the dimension of oneness, where we are just in love and bliss, the, the variation isn't there because we are in the resonance field with others that are just like us because that's how reality works when you're not bound to the physical where we get to the whole gift of, of the physical is that our densities all get to be at other places while we're in the same physical location. And that's what pr provides this great contrast. Mm -hmm. And it's how our souls get to learn is by experiencing things that we don't like because it's not what we realized we were resonating. And oh, now I'm being confronted with what my belief systems, my energetic tone, if I can say it that way, is sending out and I'm getting a mirror back to me from what I'm holding within. And it's causing me to grow in a way that on the other side, those challenges aren't there because I'm simply in the frequency of oneness. And that's the delicious diversity here. It's the painful diversity. It's the exciting diversity. It's the whole story. It's, it's the whole drama of getting to be a human. And why my understanding and, and belief is that there are so many beings vying to, for a human body saying, gosh, I really want to incarnate at that time, at this time, because the experience is so rich. And then others who are saying, I would never do that. It's way too intense. And why would I go there, you know? Right, and why would I choose to be born in a different location where famine is mm -hmm. the everyday thing? There's all these questions that are triggers for me, of you know, and I and I hear it all the time. You know, well, if God's a loving God, then why is there famine? Why is there murder? Why is there child abuse? Why is there? And it's like this huge, big elephant in the room trigger that comes back to, I think we have this belief system that, that there is justice in everything. There's a, you know, that if we do things right, these wouldn't happen. Mm -hmm. These things wouldn't happen, that there is a divine um, consciousness that delves out right and wrong when the divine consciousness is it is what it is these are all parts of the array of light that makes up our existence and this is the great thing about conversations is that we get to look at it from many angles and 
what causes triggers or when somebody somebody is attached to their view and if you challenge it well then i get to be triggered and you're wrong and i'll show you how right i am that's kind of the oh, the groundwork of this conversation today and just to feel into this thing about well if there was a just god we wouldn't know these things why does god allow this to happen and so for me that's a, a many-fold answer one of it is well that's because that's what this realm is about it's about contrast and souls want to experience contrast and on the other level it's also god saying well yeah why do you let that happen you're sovereign beings why are you choosing that why do you choose to perpetuate this world where people are suffering hmm, it's interesting that you keep choosing that because you have sovereign rights to do that or not do that here how are you planning to address that how would you like to address that and it puts the the ball back in our court versus us being the children and God's the father and dad's doing it wrong. It's like, mm, you're grown adults. I've, I've given you these powers and abilities and these gifts. What are you choosing? You're accountable to what you choose. Mm -hmm. And that's way more empowering and also daunting because it takes us out of the passive role and puts us into the active role. And we um, have consequences for what we do or don't do. Right. And I have a feeling that just this conversation is going to trigger a lot of people because <laughs> we have everything from people who say there is no God. There is, there is, you die, that is it, it is done. And, and what you make of this time on this earth, this one round is it. And, um, and for those people, atheism is, very valid, mm -hmm. just as valid for them as my belief is for me and your belief is for you. It's not for me to impose my belief on someone. So mm -hmm. when we talk about mm -hmm. our version of God, it may not be your version of God or your version of reality. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. And you don't have to fix our belief and we don't have to fix your belief. We don't have to believe the same things. We don't have to believe the same things, but we can explore this with fresh eyes every time mm -hmm. with a, a desire to understand and communicate and grow. And compassion and respect. And the visual I got that popped in when you said that was because you were talking about atheist, athe atheism and I had always grown up, I grew up religious and um, very uh, spiritual Christian. Um, but for me, there was my relationship to God had been really oppressive. Like the God that I was given was very oppressive within that continuum of uh, that religion. And when somebody like offered the idea, uh, this idea that God doesn't exist and God isn't there. There's a part of me that was like reflexively freaked out because it was always, had always been there. But then there was a part of me that tried that on and was like, well, what if God, if God doesn't exist, all this guilt and shame that I feel is completely irrelevant. Like, I don't, like all of this is associated to this religion that has all this weight and baggage for me personally in my journey. And if God just doesn't exist, then none of that's relevant anymore. And it's like you take your glasses off and put on somebody else's glasses and you see it through that, that lens. Well, instead of being like, well, those are the wrong glasses and I have the right glasses. It's like, well, let me try those on. Oh, my vision's different. Now my experience is different. What's the value? What new textures? What new content? What comes through because I've been willing to shift perspective and it doesn't mean that it's for forever, but I have now have a new experience. So I might take aspects of your lens and put them into my lens and regrind my lens so that it's a little bit more clear, a little less heavy, a little less dense for me. And that's one of the values of shifting into someone else's belief system and just checking it out like another room. Mm -hmm. Not right or wrong, it's just different. I really appreciate that. Yeah, so let's talk about feeling triggered and the emotional response and how it's shown up for us. What would you like to share about that? So one of the things that 
I have embraced because of a lot of self work and um, that I have experienced with the help of others and the work I do with others is that when we feel a strong trigger towards something, it, it is an emotional reaction to an occurrence, to an event. And if it is a strong emotional reaction, then it has very little to do with that event. It has to do with what we're bringing in from the past to that event mm. and what we hold in that event. So uh, a good representation of that is that I had an exercise where I had people hold an inanimate object and tell you something about that object. And every single person brought something and gave that information about as an objective observer, what that was, but every single person down to the last one also gave their emotional attachment to that object. And it is the same thing with events. What that object meant to them was not that inanimate object. It was what it represented and what the memories that brought with it when they're holding it. And so we do that with events. We hold those events and we see those events and how we process those events comes from our past. So um, I heard this great talk that we remember our future. And what that is talking about is how I'm experiencing this and how I move forward is based on what I'm bringing from the past. Mm -hmm. And so in essence, what we're experiencing in this life and our future is our past. Mm -hmm. And so being able to, when we're really triggered, being able to stop, take some deep breaths. There's even physical exercises you can do. Even holding fingers can slower, slow down those responses to those triggers. Holding in Jin Chin Jitsu, every single finger has different emotional relevance. And so holding a different finger, if you think you're going to be triggered for something, then you can hold a different finger and it can actually help reduce that immediate emotional response. So fear and stress is your thumb, survival. Mm. And, you know, I don't, rem I remember the ones that mean the most to me, that one, anger, guess which one's anger, your middle one, <laughs> you know, <that's> anger. <laughs> and shoulds, 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 I should do this, I'm, I'm being told I should do that. So your pinky is shoulds. And, you know, I remember that because, you know, the old hold a cup. When I was a kid, I couldn't hold a cup without putting my pinky out. Because that was what proper people did. Mm -hmm. Somewhere I learned as a child, proper people put their pinky out when they drank. And I could not pick up a glass and not have my pinky out because that's what you should do mm -hmm. as a proper person. It also makes me think of pinky swears. And pinky squares. And you know, it's like, it's like, this is a promise. You know, it's, it's like an expectation. It's a, it's a commitment of some sort. It's a behavioral alignment that you've mm -hmm. chosen to do or, or not do. Yeah. So, so just like taking that pause, taking deep breath, even asking for some time to process where you are and come back to that is all appropriate versus, mm -hmm. and that gives you a chance to think and respond versus react mm -hmm. and and i will tell you my husband says i still have lots of work to do on this one <laughs> that's very generous of him nice. and so um and and he's absolutely true i do a lot of reaction and i realize it's when somebody's pointing fingers at me telling me something, then I react. 
Mm. So um, I react to the point where there could be truth in it, but I'm not willing to hear it at the moment. And there could be falsehoods in it. And that trigger, though, is so deep that it's like a wall just goes which stops communication completely. Right. And so being able to realize that those past events are coming forward and slamming like a Mack truck into the reality of now mm -hmm. and, and saying, okay, do I want that Mack truck to destroy this or do I want to have it move on by so that we can see each other and talk? Do I have to get hit by the Mack truck or can I just step back and let it move by? Right. Do I have to get hit by it again like I have every other time when this trigger came up? And it's so true that these triggers are emotional compositions that are their imprints from our past that until we either clear them or integrate them, forgive them, whatever that process is, that is the subconscious controlling our current moment and having specific filters on that are coloring our experience. And so we're not really seeing the moment for what it is. We are seeing it from the lenses, the lenses, because there's many of the past. And I can speak, I'll, I'll just kind of share an example from my life to uh, anchor this content a little bit where this was just a couple of weeks ago at my regular job, um, my, you know, my nine to five job. And I had received what I took as a serious reprimand through a, a text message. I had, I had bumbled something twice and it was absolutely true. I had bumbled it tri twice and I was still in training, but the consequences could be very dire for um, the project that I'm working on. And so the, the message that came through to me I was just taken aback. I was like, wow, this person has never talked to me like this. I've never, anybody in this project, I've never you know, received this sort of severe um, reprimand in this way. And should I, do I need to look for a new job? Is my job safe? And I was so triggered. I, I didn't know how to function. I was like, I have to go for a drive. I can't take a nap or meditate because I'm so in this and I, called Linda and was talking to Linda about this saying, I'm really triggered right now. And she was able to say, yeah, I can feel it. I can feel what you're feeling because Linda's one of her many gifts is she's an empath as well. And it was just amazing how on fire emotionally it was. And I was able to talk to her about it and say, oh, this is, this is my abandonment stuff. This is, this is triggering this abandonment, ad abandonment fear that I, you know, I've worked on, I've cleared and cleansed to a certain degree, but there's still some root element of it here. And wow, is that on fire right now? And um, just speaking with Linda helped me to like get to a better place because it's, it's Linda. And um, then I was able to, um, it, it being in that fear, it was very interesting. So there's two parts of this where part of it made me go, okay, well, what's, re what's real for you? Does your employment have your power? Or are you connected to, to a divine source? Are you um, employed by the universe, collaborating with the universe? What's your truth? Or does somebody else have your safety and your security? So it actually flipped me into this place of surrendering and listening, listening to my guides in a much more proactive engaged way that before I was kind of playing hide and seek with them. Like this was a catalyst for me to be able to say that's not going to work anymore you just have to listen to your guides and stop pretending that you can't connect with them when you want to that's not that's a no-go now and so that was a, a, a blessing that came through by owning this and not staying in the trigger but by coming back into my divine connection and operating out of there and then when i got back to work the next day and talked about this exchange with my immediate boss, we looked at it together and I was like, oh my God, I completely read this the wrong way. I came at this, I was already feeling insecure because it, it was a new position, a new role. So my insecurities 
and all this other stuff was the lens that I read this communication through. And when I read through it with the boss, and also because it's a text, right? It's, it's, a, it's a message, it's a chat, as opposed to seeing somebody, hearing somebody and all that other data that you get. Because it's a, a black and white message, I'm able to so much more easily project my stuff onto it unwittingly and unknowingly. And I was able to say to my boss, um, it's fine. <laughs> that was an overreaction on my part. Here's some more humble pie. Um, and, and I'm fine. I get it. Um, so thank you. And I'm good. It was just a, a powerful moment of like, this was about your issue of feeling abandoned. It had nothing to do with the other person. Thank God you didn't react in that moment and let your reaction um, do what it would have done before, which would have been like, oh my God, I need to look for another job. Oh, you know, and I, and I did do looking, did do some looking for at other work, but it wasn't, I didn't let that impact all of my cons, all of my, what's the word I want? Subsequent choices. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and again, I think what you brought into the conversation is that it's, it's, being an observation and observing that, you know, if you were in that mode where you could observe that text without the um, emotion and this, the things that you were feeling before you ever got to that place, the insecurities you were feeling and all of those emotions, that brought in an evaluation, a judgment. And, and you really can't have, um, triggers unless you have judgment with those triggers mm -hmm. whether it's judgment of yourself or judgment of the other person judgment of the situation if you are in pure observation and and in curiosity then the triggers start to dissipate mm -hmm. and when you were able to step back and come back into it with your supervisor and be in observation mode and curiosity mode, it was a completely different experience. And the text was in writing, it didn't change. The only thing that changed was you. Mm -hmm. And it, it reminds me, and when we were with the triggering, is two people can go through at the exact same, live in the exact same town, live in the same house, go through the same experience, have the same parents, have, you know, all these same things and have, you wouldn't even recognize that they were sharing mutual coexistence because their experiences were so different. And so that it's, again, when you are given something, even just reading literature, what one person takes from it is what they're bringing into it as well. And so the more you can be in observation and ask questions about that and be in curiosity, the better we can move forward and re and again, for me, part of our, our thing is the, how often we can, um, where we focus our frequency and how often we focus on that and how we raise our frequency um, is that through that emotional interaction and being in that curiosity, removing the triggers, being in the questioning, being in the curiosity can give us more insight for more connection and through that connection can help us all raise our frequencies. Mm -hmm. I was a little down a rabbit hole for us, but I, I think that's accurate. And it's 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 being able to be willing. Are you willing to <clears throat> excuse me, acknowledge that you are triggered and that your trigger isn't the truth? Your trigger is a reaction. And your trigger may have some truth in it. There may be something true about it, but it's not of the truth because the truth sets us free. The truth liberates us, the truth empowers us, the truth doesn't put us into a, a victim mode. And from the victim mode, we become on, on the offensive. Um, and we, we start to counterattack because we feel attacked. Mm -hmm. 
that's not what truth does for us in my understanding of it, my experience of it. It allows us to come back into our own. Right. And, and I also love the fact that when you, one of the experiences I had with you was me feeling very triggered about um, something that was said to me about my business and about me um, by someone I cared deeply about. And you asked me, well, what part of you believes that? Mm -hmm. Because if you didn't believe that, you wouldn't be so upset about it. So what part of you believes that's still true? I was like, oh, I don't believe that that's still true. And it was like, oh, shit. Yeah, I do. There's <laughs> got to be a part of me that does. And, mm -hmm. or I wouldn't have such a visceral response. It wouldn't, it would, it would be water off my back. Right. It would be, oh, it's, it's interesting you think that. Yeah. And it would be about the other person's perception mm -hmm. and you would get to know your worth. And right. it might be one of those things where you're like, well, is that true? And it makes you think, mm -hmm. hmm, nope, nope, that's not true. Or, oh, yeah. that kind of, that a little bit is true. Huh. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's information versus your bad, a failure, messing up, whatever that associated judgment mm -hmm. is. Right. Then again, back to judgment, whether it's a self or another or a situation. Yeah. So removing the judgment, bringing in the observation, and how can that help us? Mm -hmm. and, and I think the ultimate is that it takes away the, the need to be right. You know, um, because often triggering leads to being right. It puts you in a defensive position. If you let your trigger, I mean, there's a number of things that your trigger can do for you, depending on, on the emotional content of that trigger, the emotional, uh, what I, what's the word I wanna say? What do, if, that's, if this trigger is something that puts you into anger um, which is also a form of fear, right? Anger is usually um, and, uh, connected to fear. Fear is the most mm -hmm. initial thing because it's all about separation. It's fear a secondary emotion. It's all about separation, losing control, not being in power. And so sometimes if, if I'm triggered, I might shut down and not say anything. If I'm triggered, I might you know, want to point my finger right back and show that I'm right and you're wrong and you've been always, you've always been wrong, you know, whatever that, that mm -hmm. uh, edict is. And it could, it could do any number of things. It, it could send me, send me into a, an emotional tailspin, but the fact that it is that you have a button, it's not what was said. It's that you have a button. The data mm -hmm. is you've got a button that's connected to a live wire that causes you to lose control of where you're at in this moment and you are now in the tumult of a story you're in a tornado of emotion whatever that is you're in a raging fire whatever that is mm -hmm. that's the data do you choose to lose your control and let the con let the trigger dictate your behavior or even if it feels like oh my gosh i am on a, a cliff and i'm Going downwards, I don't know where the brakes are, but I'm gonna practice braking. Like I'm in an emotional tailspin, I'm not sure how to do the brakes, but, cause I haven't done that before, but I'm gonna practice my best to, to do brakes, to stop and say, what else is there besides this big emotion? What else is there? What are my other options? I've done this again and again and again, where I got pissed off, I went into warrior mode, I counterattacked. I've done that for 30 years. I've done that for five days, mm -hmm. whatever that is. What else can I choose? Because I've already done that one before. I've done suicidal depression. I've done it so many times. What are my other options? Are there other options I can just practice even for five seconds, five minutes, a day, whatever I can muster to give myself a new imprint to work from versus the old one, which has had all of my power and all of my control and I was 
just in the throes of it and had no bearing of my own, could not find my own footing. Mm -hmm. And that's, it's so huge to just be in that question. What else, what else is possible? What else can I, what can I learn from this? And just start asking questions. And one of the things that you and I both um, are learning to maneuver in this world with is our, our empathic abilities mm -hmm. because both of us will feel these waves of emotion or someone throws anger at us it's like this you know mac truck hitting us but sometimes it's from the side and we don't even know where it came from and all at once we feel this huge grief that we're bringing into a situation or this anger and we don't even know why we're angry and stepping into the situation and we can be triggered and it's like, where is this coming from? And mm -hmm. you and I have both learned to ask the question, is this mine? Because that adds a whole nother level to dealing with triggers mm -hmm. where, mm -hmm. where I can be in a situation in a room of people and it's like, wow, this is really, like I, I step back and it's like, I just want to punch this person. What the heck is going on? And I simply ask, is this mine? And it's just kind of dissipates. That's like, oh, that wasn't even mine. Like, I don't even, I don't want to punch this person. I want to get to know this person, but why, you know, <laughs> I'm curious about this person, but I just really wanted to punch this person when I first met them mm -hmm. and it wasn't even mine. It's so powerful. And I learned that from you and just on a little side tangent, like I, I did that energetically where I was um, shopping at a store and there was this little alarm going off and it was annoying, but like, I don't get migraines. That's not my thing. I, you know, I'm very grateful that I don't have that, um, that issue in my physiology um, to contend with, but it was like all of a sudden my head was just pounding and I was like, what the heck in response to the sound? And I walked away, uh, backed away a little bit. And then I said, is this mine? Is this mine? And it was like, whoosh, and it left my head. The sound was still annoying, but it didn't trigger a migraine. And it was like somebody else's migraine had been triggered from that sound. And it's a powerful question to ask if you know that you're empathic or if, even if you're not sure that you're empathic. Or I think all of us or most of us are empathic to some degree, like mm -hmm. you know, sociopaths and you know, certain, some people who are grounders who just are very grounded and they, that's their gift is that they're very grounded and they don't pick up other people's stuff. They might not have it either. But if you're you know, watching the show, there's a chance <laughs> that you have empathic abilities <laughs> and that might be a very powerful tool to start giving yourself when all of a sudden, you're overwhelmed by an emotion and it feels like it came out of the blue or you're really down and you're not sure why it might be as simple as it's somebody else's. And if you ask it, the energies in our experience tends to be like, Nope, I'm not yours. And it walks out of the room and you don't experience yeah. it. Or, or I'll get some of it. Yeah. Some of it's yours and you've got to own it, mm -hmm. you know, and that's why you resonated with it. And it's like, Oh, yeah. Ick. yeah okay. Yeah. And, and for me also at the very, you know, you've got the analytical part of me, when I hear data that trick that, you know, we'll go into this more with the echo chambers. Mm -hmm. When I'm thinking something very viscerally, it's like, is this mine? Is this my thought? Or is this a thought I have chosen to adopt? And, mm -hmm. you know, is this is this something that I'm just regurgitating or is this actually something I've taken the time to evaluate to look at to question and decided to own mm -hmm. and so I think that might I don't know if there's anything else you want to say about triggers but it might be a good segue to go to echo chambers. Um, yeah I, I think it's well just one a couple of thoughts one is that um, I've heard this this thought, this philosophy is that um, in order for, like, so thoughts have consciousness. In order for them to stay alive, they have to be thought. 
like thought forms are energetic and in order for them to stay in existence they have to be thought because once they stop being thought then they die out and they don't exist anymore so there's this idea that you're tapping into a thought matrix um, a belief matrix and um, I just love the idea that it's like oh it's a matrix it's not me it's just a matrix I'm tapping into is it working for me or is it working against me um, so that was just a little piece I wanted to toss in there because I thought it was yeah. fascinating. And then the other thing that in terms of triggers that we're going to talk about a little bit more in, in echo chambers is that story of, um, of one upmanship because it's so endemic in our, um, culture right now on social media. It's who can top the other person who can out sass the other person who can out self righteous, the other person. And I just put you in your place, drop the mic. Yes. And I just had the word Karen, you know, okay, oh, Karen, that, okay, the, Snowflake, right? Yeah, okay, Snowflake, okay, Karen. Okay, Karen, okay, Snowflake. To label the other when they're triggered, again, is a sign of separation. Yes. It's a you. sign of dismissal. It's a sign of not recognizing what this person is going through um, and and sometimes you do have to say your stuff my stuff your stuff my stuff it's okay for you to have your stuff I'm not going to own any of it but do I have to to dismantle you or disrespect you because you are triggered do I have to resort to name calling right you know, again, like you just said, it's so dismissive. It's taking this entire person and putting them under this label of Snowflake or Karen or whatever, you know, one that may be out there or has been out there. It's very disempowering for connection, for community, and it makes it us or them us, them us. Mm -hmm. And it keeps that thought form and the need to be superior, very active and alive in our consciousness whenever we do that. Right, and, and it's all part of this. The reason we decided to do echo chambers and triggers is that they all play a role in this. <coughs> and um, one of the things that we came up with talking earlier was, you know, the question that really comes down to, am I only wanting to be heard mm -hmm. or am I wanting to be right? Yes. And do I want to be right over having connection and community? It's kind of I, what, I keeps, what I keep hearing is like there's no original idea and nothing we're saying is new. And there's lots of people who've said things more eloquently than I know I have. Um, but it's worth repeating because we're going through it again and still. And so, yeah, is it, is it more important to be right above everything else or is creating connection and understanding and finding some speck, even if it's very small, a mutual reality that we can build on more important. Yeah. And it always brings me back down to the question of what is our value? What are our values? Is my, so my values are collaboration, communication, freedom, authenticity, and you know, there's a whole array of values. And if I flip into, I'm going to tell you what, and you're going to be sorry you ever said that, then that goes against my value of communication, of community, of connection. It goes against those values. So I've compromised my values and I only give them lip service. My real value is being right and being able to prove that I'm superior and telling you where to get off. Like that's, those are my real values. If that's what I choose to activate in my relationships. Right. I just think it's much better to write down the anger or type down the anger, but then don't send it. That whole, that old chestnut of writing the angry letter or writing the angry post 
and you don't send it, but you let yourself start to process the emotion. You don't deny the emotion, but you don't hit somebody with your emotion because that is just perpetuating more of everything you've already experienced. Right. Yeah. And, and um, there are people, energetic beings here on this earth who really feed off of triggering people, off of trauma and drama. And so do you want to participate in that or do you want to step aside and say, this isn't my thing? And, yeah. and you can call out behavior. So, so um, this will go into the echo chambers, but also triggers. Um, I was in a group of very well-meaning, very conscious, loving people in my community who stood up one after the other and said horrific things about, I'm going to throw some triggers in here, Trump. Mm -hmm. And I am not a person who likes Trump. Now, do I see that, that he's done a few good things? Oh my gosh, I'm going to trigger some people. Yes, he has. <laughs> so no matter what I do, and white. Like, I'm going to trigger someone, right? It's but like, also, it's just on that, it's not black and white. Right. Like, the thing is, it's like there's this addiction to black and white thinking. And I'll let yeah. you go. I just had to pop that in there. It is. You're right. And there's this whole array. And, and so I'm hearing, you know, this very visceral mic drops over and over and, com and anger and rage. And, I, and all I could sit there and think of is that our this community that I'm in believes we are all connected, that we are all from divine source, that we are all divine. So are we or aren't we? And I had to go back to that question. I can be upset at you over your behavior. I can say, I don't want that behavior in my presence. I can say, I don't want to live in a country that, that actually thinks this is a great behavior or a community that thinks this is a great behavior, then it's up to me to either try to show alternatives to that, to speak alternatively to that, and win you over versus telling you what to do. Win you what? Win you over. Win, like when have a over, discussion. I was like, when you're and over what? When, when you're, you're over. over what? Win <laughs> you over, W-I-N, um, through discussion, through expansion. Through example. Through example. And, um, and so I had to step back and say, okay, I have to, there, as much as I walk by and say my trigger words as I have, you know, I was telling you earlier, I have this thing that is my coping mechanism of thinking of the mother of that 70s show with her little hair bobbing, going <laughs> dumb. <laughs> what would she say? Well, I was not going to say it because I didn't want to have us flagged. I don't know what we can say or not say. You can beat me out, dumbass. Dumbass. <laughs> dumbass. <laughs> and, and so that is my that is my way of dealing with behavior that I just uh, triggers me that I don't like that I need to find within me and 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 process and how do I want to deal with this in my life or not deal with this in my life, but that it's there. Do I want to just not, do I want to shut off the TV and never see it? Do I want to confront it? Do I want to do some stand out on a corner with a sign that says hate is bad? I mean, what do I want to do with, with this information? But my initial to help me deal with that trigger of anger instead of feeling anger is I have this thing that pops in my head with orange hair that says dumbass and it's a way for me to laughingly stop the trigger mm -hmm. so that I can step back 
but it also allows me to say his behavior that I don't appreciate, that I don't like, that in that particular moment does not does not also or does not equate to him not being a divine being. We are not our behavior. And yes, we are living our choices, but who we are is beyond that. Isn't that the awakening that we're coming into? Mm -hmm. That we are all one. Either we are all one or not. And which one do you choose? And sometimes it's, it's a moment to moment choice, right? Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, that, that's my tangent on that. But. I love it. This leads into echo chambers. And what I feel is that when there's a consortium of triggers and everyone shares similar triggers, this is what creates echo chambers. We all believe the same thing. We're all triggered, or, you know, close enough. We're all triggered by the same thing. We all have agreed that we should be angry about this and that we are right in this and that we need to impress upon everybody else our rightness and get them to think like us and then we'll be safe again. Things will be okay once we get people to believe the way that we believe. Mm -hmm. and, and those echo chambers are even more supported now because we have algorithms that feed us more of the same. Whatever we are thinking of, we are more of the same. You know, and if you like this and you'll like this, you'll like, you'll this, like this and you'll, if you like this channel, you'll like this channel. If you like this topic, you like this topic. Mm -hmm. And so it leaves, leads down these rabbit holes of um, where you're in the entire colony of the same color rabbit in the rabbits when you you actually did not even realize that there's a whole barnyard of other animals out there that you could be interacting with. <laughs> and it is that thing that we were talking about before the show started was uh, Stars on Thars, the Dr. Seuss piece, yeah. where it's like, we've all been branded, we're all woke, or we're all, you know, whatever that label is and this is who we are this is our um brand and if you're not inside of that then i don't know how to really connect with you because there's something wrong with you there's something inherently wrong with you <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah and yeah i i think everybody should read that book again because it it's timeless and it's um, we were talking again, masks. We were talking about the masks are the stars at this point, you know, that, that we are using that as almost as a symbol. It has, it has turned into a political device versus a device or a belief even, whether it's political or a belief. It is our star mm -hmm. I, or I, not star that we're choosing to wear. Right, and explain, I guess people maybe don't know what Stars on Thars is, not yeah. everybody grew up with that. So if you wanna explain what Stars on Thars is. Sure, for those of us that are older, don't have kids, that or young that don't have kids, um, or haven't been read Dr. Seuss. Poor um, yeah, gosh, <laughs> <laughs> my heart goes out to you. <laughs> so, so Dr. Seuss made this beautiful book, Stars on Thars, that, um, is, you know, and this is me remembering it as an over 50 year old, um, that these birds had, some of them had stars on their chest, stars on stars, and others did not. And the others that one, one felt superior to the other. And the ones with stars, I think, I can't remember which which one was the superior at this the point. The ones that had stars on their bellies and they end up ending yeah. up every which place, but it was stars on your belly. And if you did, then it was like this elite group that had stars. Uh huh. And then the other was not uh, good enough because they didn't. And so they went through a machine that actually got them to have stars. And so then the other group had to take the stars off to separate themselves again. And pretty soon they were all going through the machine so quickly that no one knew who had stars and who didn't anymore. 
like some had no stars, some had like three stars, some had, mm -hmm. it was just this whole mishmash now because they had let this um, need for separation and superior, superiority um, dictate them to the point where they just uh, looked kind of funny at the end. Yeah, and and so what a wonderful world where we could have it so mixed up that we can't tell anymore. And those echo chambers start so very young and you know from wanting to do and be and reinforce um, everything within a family unit to be safe to being in a clique in school we spend our entire childhood trying to fit in and then we send spend our adulthood trying to stand out <laughs> Our work or to fit in in a community or you know that there's all these different nuances but um, that echo chamber is our way of staying safe going back to the echo chamber it's finding that and, and we in business and in marketing find your tribe how many times have you heard find your tribe find your tribe find your tribe because you know they're going to buy your product well we we find our tribe all the time but by finding our tribe and staying in our tribe we don't understand what's happening with the other tribe mm -hmm. we don't understand what's going on and we dismiss it and we call them names and we and we just fail to even have curiosity anymore mm -hmm. um and how sad is that that the curiosity is gone and i'm saying in generalities thank goodness not everything is black and white we've got all kinds of shades and shifts happening um but but you know one of the things that we've talked about is that we listen to things that tend to validate our unconscious beliefs we already believe. so that we are right mm -hmm. And it's important to say one, you know, what if I'm wrong? What if I'm wrong? Mm -hmm. What other possibilities are there? And be willing to step out of your comfort zone, step out of your echo chamber, step out of your algorithm that, and use a different browser, use a VPN, step in from a different country. I know we're talking about different things technologically. Get out of your neighborhood. Take different paths home, go to different restaurants, try different foods. Talk to different people that don't believe what you believe with curiosity and get out of the echo chamber. Mm -hmm. Be willing to get out of your comfort zone and be willing to be uncomfortable mm -hmm. because in the unexpected, that's where I feel like God lives in the unexpected. We're, we're able to reconnect to the authentic moment when we come out of our day to day and come out of our regimen and our um, patterns. And then when we're able to, catch the blip, that unexpected moment, that's where a divine spark of connection can actually be fostered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and stepping out of our comfort zone and stepping into something else doesn't do a lot of good if we aren't willing to step out of our personal um, attitudes and our personal um, beliefs mm -hmm. long enough to suspend them to discover what else is available and what else is out there and our willingness to even shed the clothes of, of who we think we are. It's like you said, putting the different glasses on. Um, you know, I, I've, people from other countries often laugh at people from the United States because we go to other countries and we're so identifiable because we don't blend. We don't 
we don't have curiosity to experience life as something else. Yeah, we bring our culture with us and mm -hmm. we expect it to just be accepted as opposed to actually there are other ways of doing, there are other ways of eating, there are other ways of communicating. And it's sort of this, um, the bravado of our culture where we feel entitled to, uh, we can, I want to say everybody by any means, but right. there's, there's, there's a belief of feeling this entitlement of like, well, it's the greatest culture there is. So of course I'm going to bring it with me and I'm going to wear my sweatpants to breakfast in public. And people are just like, what are they, you know, that's, it's shocking to them that you would, you know, assault the world <laughs> with your sleepwear. Um, yeah, I think it's, it can be so refreshing to, to, to travel and to live abroad and some of us crave it and some of us are really frightened by it. But I think, again, it's a thing of, do you want to keep being the person you've always been or, and expect, you can't be the person you've always been and evolve. Like it's, you get to choose. It's, it's going to be an either or one uh, option there. And it, it doesn't have to be all overnight, but for goodness sakes, start um, chipping away at some of your norms and be willing to explore something that's new. Um, Otherwise, and I love that symbology that you were saying, like with like the stars on Thars are now like the masks on Americans, you know, like, and it's not to comment on the masks, whether they're good or bad, they're, it's a point of division. It's not saying whether we're, Linda and I are not saying we think you're good or bad or right or wrong if you do or don't wear a mask, because we're not engaging that. We're looking at the spectrum of options, but it's just another symbol in our culture of like you versus me and um, us versus them. And what if everything you believe about the coronavirus, whether, whatever you believe, what if everything is wrong or what if parts of it are wrong or what if, you know, it's just like, let there be some willingness to see a range of conversation, not the one that we may be clinging onto and defending our life with, it could be really doing this a disservice. How do you know unless you start to ask questions? Right. And that there's, there's room for nuance. I mean, again, both things can be true. Mm -hmm. How can that be? Well, because in certain circumstances, it can be this and in other circumstances, it can be that. And we don't know with this type of person, it could be this with this type of person, it could be that we don't know. We don't know what we don't know. Yeah. And we only see what we're looking at. And it makes me think of that analogy of the, that old analogy of like the four or five blind men who are all touching an elephant. And they're all describing what an elephant is. And one's touching the leg, one's touching the trunk, one's touching a tail. And, you know, one's, you know, the skin on the back. And they're, they're all saying this is what an elephant is and they are all right but they are not all absolute because they're only grasping the piece that they are currently in contact with that's all that they can report but there's a wider whole other range that mm -hmm. is the continuum of the elephant <laughs> right right and um one of the things we talked about was when we stay in these echo chambers, it's, it's the filters that are given support our beliefs and help us feel like we are in control. Mm -hmm. And so, so again, it, it is back into enforcing our belief systems, feeling though, as though we have control over the situation versus saying, you know what, I don't know. It's okay to say, I don't know. Or this is all I know. And this is all I know, right. This is, this is what I know and this is what I base what I know on. Can you show me anything different than that? Mm -hmm. I have that conversation a lot. Can you show me something different on that? And so it's being willing to ask those questions. Um, you made a comment too. When you step out of those echo chambers, you're standing out. When you stand out, it's like the poppy that gets the head chopped off. Yeah, the tall poppy syndrome of like, if you stand out and you're not part of the, the norm, then you, have a, you can have a target on your back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
and if you're willing and it's interesting right now how wanting to not stand on an end not and wanting right. to come wanting to not stand at one end oh, or yeah. another okay of the spectrum one spectrum or the other and wanting to find common ground is actually that poppy standing up where both sides want to cut your head off. Yeah. Yeah. How, <laughs> How dare, you dare you turn the light on and look at everybody equally? Don't you know you're only supposed to shine the light that direction and not on everyone? Right. Ooh. How dare you? not label this person can't you see how they're behaving mm -hmm. you must think you're better than everybody if you're not participating in the you know the mockery of somebody you must not oh mm -hmm. yeah so um and 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 it that other part is it goes again goes back to the triggers going back to being right that goes back to the you know i'm triggered I'm reacting, I'm basing that on what I bring from my past, which is in my echo chamber of life. And my goal is to mic drop on you and walk away so I don't have to hear your response. Yes, it's to finally silence you because I have out sassed you, I have out truthed you, I have out Righteous nation to you. <laughs> what would you say? Smarted you. <laughs> Outsmarted you. Yeah, that's probably a faster way of saying it. So it's just, uh, and that is the addiction that is in social media so hard right now. Yeah. So I think our goal here is asking people to question, be in the question, question motives of the information that they're getting. I'm asking that of people. What's the motive of the data that you're receiving? What's the motive behind the people, the entity of the data that you're receiving? The person that is standing in front of you talking, what's your own motive behind this? And what don't you know? And can there be any kind of room for nuance and connection and a starting place. Because when we really get down to it, we all deal with the same core beliefs of needs and emotions. We want to be safe. We, we want to have loved. joy and love. Mm -hmm. And we want to be validated and if we can start working towards that as a goal, then I think we're going to create a better world. And that is one of the things we hope to do here. Yeah, I think that is one of the things we are doing. I just want to set that as a choice and an intention that we are choosing to do that. And we invite you to join us in doing that because your lenses, your perspective, I, I'll try on your glasses and you're going to give me something I never saw before. And I could never have had that experience if you didn't show up and if you weren't willing to let me try your glasses on. I can't grow if you don't show up and bury your heart and tell me your truth and allow me to reconsider what I believe and shift my perspective. We need each other in community so that we can all realize that we are so different and yet so the same and isn't that wonderful and rich and meant to be celebrated right right and um you know with everything that's going on i really hope that as our community grows that we do it with respect and curiosity and support for each other in our journeys well, I would say that it's a mandate. I would say that that yeah. is a value and that is a structure within this community that we're co-creating. And when something is not in alignment with that, we will address that in the very nature we're speaking of, which is to be supportive and to be inclusive and also to have boundaries. So if you know someone feels it is their right to spout off and put somebody in their place, then you're not going to last in the community because 
that's not us creating an echo chamber. That's us creating a value of integrity and a value of, of safety. And we're willing to listen to your core beliefs and entertain your core beliefs. Destructive, toxic behavior, we're not entertaining, but we will address it in ways that are um, honest and fair and real and authentic and respectful. Even if it's a hand up, it's like, nope, BS stops here. It will be done respectfully and it will be done <laughs> for sure. Um, and then my final two cents is that I really encourage people to, I say it's my final two cents, we'll see what happens. But I encourage people to uh, do some value exploration. Uh, there's lots of things online that you can do, lists of values that you can go through and do little tests or little, little um, I'll just say exploration, to determine mm -hmm. what your values are. And if you're crisp and clear on your values, you have them posted somewhere, you talk about them with friends, it will be more of a, you'll get when you're working against your values. When something happens and it starts feeling really crappy and you've compromised your values somewhere, or you're working against your values somewhere, it will become more visceral to you because you've had this conscious integration of what your values really are about and the values that you want to uphold. And maybe they're values that you've not upheld, but you really want to, and you want to start practicing that. And that's your new challenge. Mm -hmm. That's great. Do that with us. We'll support you in doing that. And I guess my last one is that there's a difference between values and echo chambers. And if you yeah. find yourself only hearing things that you believe in, it's time to change a channel and do some exploration, change yeah. the bandwidth of, and hear other things so that you can expand because that is part of this. Yeah, you can share the same values and have conflicting, conflicting or different belief systems with somebody, mm -hmm. but you can share the same core values. The way they express yeah. might be different. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. All right. Wonderful. Thank Excellent. you for joining us. Thank you for being here and, and connecting with us. And as always, we'd like to hear your comments, your feedback, your questions, ideas for topics. Your um, input is what will make this community grow and be the delicious, dynamic creature it wants to become. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.